Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, all I can say is that when I first came here, I was 6'5 and good looking. Don't, look, don't do this work. Don't try it. Don't try it. Don't try it. It's, uh, it. You see what happens to you when you, you do this kind of work. I am delighted to be with you today. Uh, as, as Douglas and Anna said, I'm a demographer by training, and uh, so I look at a lot of uh, issues um, at various geographic scales uh, through the lens of demography. And ladies and gentlemen, our country is in the midst of an unprecedented demographic transformation. And what I would suggest to you is the way we handle and manage demographic change is going to determine whether we are successful and are capable of thriving, prospering, and competing in a highly volatile global economy where the new normal is certain uncertainty. The only thing that you can rest assured on today is certain uncertainty. So if you turn your phone off and when this se session is over, turn it back on, something could be totally disruptive that disrupts everything. And that happens on just about <coughs> every day now, uh, those kinds of changes. And what I want to talk about today, though, I want to talk about this notion of disruptive demographics. And I'm really concerned about vulnerable populations because, ladies and gentlemen, the other part of competitiveness is we know that people and firms are consumers of place. And so the way you manage and handle and help the least among us is going to be also a key to being able to thrive and prosper. So I want to talk about this notion of cities compete just like firms. And so the way that you brand and market yourself as a place matters in this economy. And you only have one time to screw it up because it can go viral on you in about 10 seconds and you are history if that happens to you. So I want to talk about a quick snapshot of what I've looked at in terms of uh, Memphis and its demographics within the context of the nation and the region. A quick window on persistent inequality. I had the uh, good fortune and the honor a couple of years ago, 2018, of coming uh, for the 50th anniversary celebration of the King assassination and did some work. I want to share some of that with you about persistence. And then uh, I want to argue for you that the working poor is a propitious opportunity. Solving the problems of the working poor is a propitious opportunity for us, the key to our competitiveness. And then I want to talk about how you do it, for this notion of how do we pursue more inclusive and equitable development? How do we generate greater shared prosperity where there's equal opportunity of access or equitable opportunities of access so that you're able to thrive and prosper and compete? So demographically, the South is all that in a bag of chips plus a dip, okay? <laughs> you know, for the first three quarters of the 20th century, it was the place to leave because it had all kinds of economic challenges. It had all kinds of racial challenges. <laughs> it was the place to leave. I grew up in the South, and I went to college, uh, high school in 1968. And I remember it as if it were yesterday. Let's just say, I can't say I was an athlete. Just just say I was on the team. <laughs> I was on the football team. And I remember in my ninth grade year, my freshman year, our first game was an away game. And when we arrived at the stadium, the KKK was marching outside the stadium, daring us to beat the opposing team. We beat them so bad they couldn't spell KKK by the end of the night. <laughs> That was the South at the time, but I couldn't wait to get out. Lots of people did that, ladies and gentlemen. If you looked at the data very carefully, what you would see is that this region of the country only captured about 30% of net national population growth for the first 70 years of the 20th century. But in every decade since 1970, the South has captured over half 
of net national population growth in this country, including the period 2010 to 2017, we added another 17 million people to our population in this country, 9.2 million of them here in the South. That's about 55% of that net growth concentrated right here in the South. Uh, we're growing the nation growing at about 5.4%, the South growing at about 7.9%, in Tennessee growing at 5.5%, but here in Memphis you grew by 1%, about 9,300 people added to your population during that period. Okay. <clears throat> What's the slow growth? What's the product? That 9,200 people, where well, you lost 33,000 people to migration, you gain 42,000 between of natural change. That's excess of births over death. So you got great out migration to the extent that you were growing during this period. It was through natural population change because you're a net exporter of folk. Now, I don't know if you know this, but the IRS comes tax time is coming. So this is appropriate. The IRS produces a migration file every year. So when you file your taxes, if you have moved, they count you as a migrant. And so in the file, they know whether you moved into an area or you left the area or if you were a non-mover. And in the file, they also have your adjusted gross income and your number of exemptions. So I know where you live, how much money you make, and whether you've been running away from somewhere or running towards someplace. And so when you look at that data, it gives you some insights into what kinds of people are coming in and leaving your community. And so if you looked at the, this, the latest data, 2015, 2016, you had 342,000, let's just say 343,000 tax filers here with an adjusted gross income of about $31,000. OK. Anybody that moved from outside the state in here had an adjusted gross income of about twenty seven thousand dollars, less than what the average person who lives here. But then there are some people who come that bring what we call a migration dividend. What is that? Their adjusted gross income is greater than the income of anybody who lives here. OK. And so you had about close to 5,000 households with an adjusted gross income of about $35,000 moving from places that send high quality, if you use income as a, as, a, as, a, as a metric, high quality migrants to your place. And then you had about 6,800 families coming from places that are negative dividends. What's a negative dividend? Their adjusted gross income is $21,000 a year when the average person who lives here is what? $31,000 a year. And so you can begin to figure out, you know, who and what kinds of people are coming to your community. And so we have looked at those specific people who are coming in, people who are leaving, and we're looking at specific communities that we have both origin and destination flows, 109 counties. Uh, the inflow is about seven to 500 families. The outflow is about 8,200 families, so you're losing 740 some families there. In those positive dividend communities, what that means is people are coming here with higher incomes than people who don't live here. Um, you're still losing about 375,000 families there, and a bigger, larger number of people have coming from negative dividend communities. You lost about 300 and some thousand, uh, 390, <laughs> close to 400 uh, families there, tax, play, tax filers. Uh, and so if you look at all of those counties where you get dividends, either positive or negative, uh, aggregate is a negative dividend for people coming in. Those positive dividends, there are about 40 counties where you get positive dividends from. Person coming in, about $42,000 a year. The person leaving, about $37,000. So you get a net value of about $5,100 per person coming in. That's adult money. You want to keep that coming, OK? <clears throat> but at the same time, you have what? People who are coming in who their money is less than what exists here. You get a negative <coughs> dividend there. <clears throat> we know where they're coming from. 
Uh, these are the positive dividend folks. So you got about 12% of those folks coming from the Northeast. You got about 4% of them coming in from the Midwest. You got 19% of them coming from out West. And of course, the majority are coming from within the South here of positive dividends. And you see uh, the places that are People are arriving in Memphis and Shelby County from all of those places, but they are, they are bringing uh, value, economic value in terms of the resources that they make. Now, at the same time, you have uh, negative dividends, uh, these communities where people are coming, but they don't make as much money as the people who live here. Those are more localized kinds of communities, uh, usually in and around uh, Memphis. You see them concentrated in the South, 73% of them here in the South, but you can see uh, quite a number of places in the Midwest uh, and the like. So what you really want to do is you want to you focus on advertising in those places where people got, got cash. Tell them, and a lot, of, a lot of places, a lot of communities that are slow growing like you are now engaging in what are called bring back our own policies, where they're encouraging people who left, went away and are doing very, very well to come back what? Home. Mm -hmm. And there's never been a better time to do that because we are an aging nation. So lots of people have what are called location specific capital here. They have parents and grandparents and the like. If you can think about that as an economic development strategy, bringing that talent back is something that is value add. Lots of places are doing that kind of work today in terms of what goes on. And the reason this is important, so you can look at these these debt origins and destinations and see what happens. But so what does it mean? What's, what are you losing? Well, you gain 9,300 people, but you lost 24,000 whites. Uh, uh, growth for, uh, about 7% decline. You lost, uh, uh, this is a very small population, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander population, but you're gaining blacks and you're gaining Hispanics. Uh, and so to the extent that uh, loss isn't even greater if you didn't have that growth in your African-American population and your Hispanic Latino population. If those of you who remember me coming early, I talked about the browning of America and the browning of your region. You're losing whites, but you're gaining these non-white groups that are transforming, further transforming the complexion of your society. But, uh, and, and so that's what you see going on. But what's growing? Your 65 plus population. What's declining? Your under 25 population. Okay? And very slow growth among your 25 to 44 population. Your boomer population is declining. So you're an aging community. But that's both good. That's good. Because there are huge, huge opportunities in the aging marketplace for business development infrastructure redevelopment and all of that. So it's, it's, it, there's, there's a silver lining there if you think about, uh, and I know you all are working on age-friendly models and things of that nature, but um, you do have to figure out, though, how to get some young folk here. Otherwise, you won't have enough young people to take care of what? The older people. Your caregiver ratio will be out of whack uh, totally. And that, what I usually say is when people, all you, do, all you have to do is look at your own family and you say, well, I'm getting old and I got three kids. Well, only one of them worth anything, so don't expect that. <laughs> so, um, your caregiver, don't be, don't be confused by your, the number of kids. The, your caregiver <laughs> ratio is about a third of that, so understand the definition. But so, we, so you got, got some things to do here, here in all of this. And understand, these, these young folks down here, look, your, your white population, the median age is 45. That's the end of fertility, folks, okay? That's the end of fertility. You, you need all of these folks, these young people, because they're in the middle of their childbearing years. And that's what you need to grow. You need migration and you need some action among that population. <clears throat> Early and often. <laughs> so, so, so when I was here to look to, for the King uh, anniversary celebration, I looked at what had happened in Memphis and Shelby County 
from between 1970 and 2016. That was, those were the earliest data. And uh, this, is, this is the employed population of Memphis, age 15 and over. I have the data for both sexes and races, college educated and not college educated, uh, for 1970, right? after 68, okay, and then 2016, the latest data. So if you looked at the black-white difference in unemployment in 1970, there was 11, 12 percent difference. That means blacks were uh, 12 percent, the, the unemployment, the, the employment rate for blacks was about 12 percent below that. Uh, 59 percent of whites were employed, 47 percent of blacks. If you go over here, fast forward, to 2006, the difference narrowed to about 6.3%. So you did get some narrowing. Uh, and among the college educated people, the difference was about 1.2% in the employment, 70% uh, for whites, 69 for blacks. Uh, but fast forward over here, uh, blacks actually employed a little bit higher than college educated blacks. But the, the, what I want to draw your attention to is the not college educated. Uh, there was a 9.8% difference in employment in, uh, 19, in 1970. It dropped to about 5.1%. But the thing that I want to draw, draw your attention to is these numbers, about 45 to 55% of people who were not college educated were employed in 1970. All of these numbers are lower in 2016. Fewer people employed in 2016 than in what? 1970. <clears throat> OK? So your unemployment, the percentage of people who are employed goes down dramatically uh, there. And it's, and it's interesting because it is a male problem. It is a male problem across categories. Look at 1970, across all race and ethnic groups, 60 to 78, 79% of people employed. It drops down to what? Every group employed at a lower rate. I don't care whether you're college educated or uneducated, but it's all this. So I talked about last time I was here, the end of men thesis, where men are doing much more poorly today than compared to 1969. All men, all men. And you see it quite clearly in the data where you have fewer people employed. Well, that raises a whole series of questions about how do you have and form and maintain stable families, stable communities, stable anything when you have that kind of manifestation in your employment mix. Not unique to Memphis, it is a national problem, but <laughs> When you factor in that on top of not growing, it creates another challenge for you in terms of your community. <clears throat> and for women, uh, you, you see the major gains were for, uh, among women uh, in terms of employment, higher rates uh, through all of the categories uh, over time. Uh, uh, women were actually, black women were actually highly, more highly em employed in the uh, 70s than uh, white women. Uh, that all changed as white women entered the market in larger numbers. You see the, the black-white difference, flip, uh, it narrowed, it's about 5.8% difference there. And you see uh, here the same thing. So women uh, increased their presence in the, the labor force and in the labor market. Uh, and, um, but it's the, the wages, you see a similar pattern. In 1970, this is both sexes. For black, the black-white difference in wages was 56%. What that means is blacks made 56 cents for every one dollar that whites made. Uh, it uh, got worse. It, they made six. It got better. 63%, uh, 63 cents for every dollar in 2016. Uh, but for the black difference, here was 85 dollar, 85 cents for, per dollar, black-white. Uh, here, it dropped down to 65 cents. So it went in the opposite direction. Uh, and the not college, it was 52%. Uh, that narrowed to 71%. But again, look at these, these wage rates. I mean, you, you can't, can't, 
maintain a stable family, a stable existence on those kinds of wages. And so you still have, you have two problems. You have continuing inequality and you got uh, decreasing participation in the labor market and decreasing economic well-being as a force function of that participation in the market. Uh, and uh, you got the same data for, for, black, for males and, and females here, so I, I'm going to leave this uh, for you all to look at. But uh, you see modest, uh, you know, 56 cents on the dollar versus 54 cents on a dollar, 62 cents on the dollar per dollar versus 57 percent. It all goes in the wrong, except for, for uh, the less college educated. So we have this persistence uh, in inequality in terms of who's participating in a labor market and how, who's getting paid and how much they're getting paid in the market for all of this. Uh, the same pattern is for, for women, uh, uh, slightly different in terms of, of women, black women worked at a much higher rate and even made more money because of their labor force participation in the 70s, but that was reversed and flipped uh, by uh, uh, the 2016. And so not much progress made over that period between the King assassination and 2016, according to these data. Uh, and you looked at the gender wage gap. Uh, women made 40 cents for every dollar that men made in 1970. Black women made 33 cents, white women 43%, so about 43% uh, uh, on the dollar. Uh, some progress, all women are up to 75 cents for every $1 male made in 2016, white women 90 cents, black women 67% on the dollar, and you can see it for college educated women and not college educated women. Uh, we still have a huge gender wage gap, although women are participating in the market at a higher rate, and so all of that needs to be factored into any kind of strategy that you start talking about when you start talking about how do you think of more inclusive and equitable development. It is an employment problem, it is a wage problem, and the like, and you gotta factor in all of those kinds of things and making it happen. And I got concerned about these issues based on the work that we do uh, in nearby Durham, where Douglas used to live, uh, and where uh, I have a school that I operate, uh, I want to just share some data as a sort of comparison of what's going on in Memphis versus Durham. Durham is one of the probably most rapidly growing communities in the South. Uh, and it's attracting people from all over the place uh, in terms of migration destination. This is 2014, 2015. I want to show you how big it is. So if those migration destinations that I showed you from Memphis, the people coming to Durham from Manhattan, New York, bring a migration dividend of $56,000 more than anybody who lives in Durham per capita, okay? If we're coming from Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's 21,000. Yonkers, New York, it's 19,000. Arlington, Virginia, it's 15,000. It's 22,000 from Herndon, Virginia. San Diego, California is $31,000. All of these people, so the migration dividend for Durham, the median is about $11,000, but it ranges from what? 50 some thousand to uh, about four or $5,000. Now you understand how people coming into a place like that, what happens to the cost of living? This place, it drives up the cost of things. So if you look at downtown Durham now, there's nothing under a million dollars downtown and uh, for, to purchase and nothing under about $1,400 to rent in terms of, huh. so the question becomes, what happens to everybody else in that place? And it's not one or the other, you wanna be able to think about these issues in a different format. And we've gotten to a situation where civil servants, people who are actually employed to protect public health and safety in the community, can't afford to live in the community that they employ to protect public health and safety. Median income is about $54,000 in Durham. That's what a municipal clerk makes, a bus driver, a firefighter, middle school teacher, a postal service mail carrier, and a police officer. Beginning police officer starts at $37,000 a year. 
and I'm going to risk my life for y'all. <laughs> the whole population that can't afford to live in the place that they're supposed to live in. And I got at this because that's a school that we've built for vulnerable children in Durham. It's six blocks from downtown. Uh, we have 200 kids, uh, black and Latino, 95% free and reduced lunch and all of that stuff. And this is the, this is the, this is the staff, okay? of the school. This is everybody from the administrators all the way down to the teachers. The blue line, the dark, the black line, the blue, dark blue line, is the amount of money they need to make to live in Durham, okay? But the light blue line is actually how much they make, okay? You'll note a slight difference in what they make. But what I want to focus in on now, I know all of these folks because they work for us. And we bust our butt to try to pay them the best ways that we can pay them. But I want to fo focus on uh, three of them. This is my fourth grade teacher right here. She has four kids of her own. She's got a master's degree and a knock your socks off teacher. But everybody I'm about to show you all is homeless. Everybody I'm showing you is homeless. They're called the sheltered homeless. They might be living, sleeping on your couch tonight, yours tomorrow night, or they're renting these hotel rooms that you can rent on a what? Weekly basis, okay? okay? And if you don't know about the hotels that you rent on a weekly basis, they're usually the hotbeds of what? Sex trafficking and the like. So she's got four kids that She's trying to deal with. She makes $49,000, I'm sorry, $46,000 with us to live in Durham. She needs, with her kids, this is just cover basic necessities, she needs to make $97,000. So she has a $51,000 deficit in what she does. Last week, Wednesday night, I got a call at about 11 o'clock at night. She and her four kids on the street because they didn't have enough money to pay for the the hotel room for the rest of the week. Now, this person has played by every rule, gone to school, got educated <laughs> multiple times, degree, four kids, knock your socks off teacher, can't afford a place to live. This is our IT administrator. He's got three kids of his own, two kids that go to school at our school, just had a new, new baby. He makes about 42,000. He needs to make 86,000 to live basic cover, basic necessities. So his is $43,000. And then we have a teaching assistant. She's a single parent. She makes about 30. She needs to make 44, given the age and mix of her kid. So ladies and gentlemen, we have a whole generation of people civil servants, public school teachers that can't afford to live in the basic communities that they're required to protect your, your health and safety, to educate our kids and the like. And they've not done anything wrong. They're the working poor. That's the new working poor. Everybody up here got a college degree. A couple of them got master's degrees, but can't do it. So, and what I want to suggest to you is fixing this problem is a form of economic development. Why? Because if we can improve the wages and the social economic well-being of these people, if we up their wages, what are they going to do with their money? They're going to spend it. And that, that, the externality effects of that expenditure does what? There's an externality effect. It creates other jobs and other opportunities in the community. And they are the deserving poor because they work or they bloke them broken. In other words, fixing the working poor problem creates opportunities for what? The non-working poor. Yes, ma'am. Did your estimates of earning need also include any higher education? Yeah, so, so this is the United Way measure. When you look at that, it, it gets it could get worse with that. But this is this is based on the what it costs to cover your basic necessities, uh, it, it, that only exacerbates it, makes it even worse. And, and so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I didn't want to totally depress you today, so. <laughs> but you, you, you're absolutely right. 
you're absolutely right. <clears throat> so what does your working poor profile look like? So I went through and I looked at your workforce and I look at by, uh, by number of indicators. So this is the, the representation of various racial and ethnic groups in your workforce. And then I said, who's working poor? Working poor definition, 27 weeks or, uh, or more where you don't make enough money to live an above poverty level existence. Uh, and uh, you've either been looking for work or you were working and you just don't make enough money. And so, I looked at your working poor, who's overrepresented based on their representation in the workforce. So 50% of your workforce is, of all workers are African American, but of the working poor, 65% of them are African American. About 5.7% of all workers are, um, what is it, Hispanic, but 11% of them are uh, the working poor, other races, about 2%. But notice, 20% of your white population are working poor. They're not, over, they're not overrepresented, but so we're not talking, with, it's an equal opportunity thing. It's just some groups are worse off than others. So when you start talking about your working poor, they're black, they're Hispanic, they're other races, but they also include other folk, although they're underrepresented. Uh, they tend to be female. The population workforce is about 50% female, but this population is 58% female. But notice, 42% of all males are working poor around here. Thirty-five percent of your population of all workers are 19 to 34, but 62 percent of them are what? Working poor. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the next generation of talent that has to do what? Prepare. Prepare. But even among mature people, it's 38 percent of folk who work every day. They're working poor. They don't have an above poverty level existence. <clears throat> They are less than high school, they're high school, there's some college, 33% of people that got some college, working poor. No, it's not as bad as Durham, but, you know. And even 9% of people with a bachelor's degree holder here. It's about 10 or 12% in Durham, bachelor's degree or higher, that work every day, don't have above poverty level existence. <clears throat> Never married, separated a widow. But even over here, you still see people who are in this population. <clears throat> Single-headed households, people living in group quarters, but even a quarter of married and cohabitating people working poor. So it doesn't, I mean, yeah, you get these overrepresentations, but it's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. <clears throat> Where, what are the occupations? Personal care and service occupations, transportation, sales, production, construction, and farming, all overrepresented. But 10% of people in professional occupations, working poor, working poor. So how do you think about getting your arms around this? And I think we saw it, the impacts ladies and gentlemen, in the government shutdown. We saw how many people do what? Live paycheck to paycheck in our society. Inequality in any form, shape, or fashion is bad for business. And so we have to figure out how to fix the problem. For you, I did the same thing for you. Selva County, your median income is about 47 close to $48,000. These are the people who, who work every day, who earn less than that median. These people, uh, I'd use the same group of folks from Durham. So you got people who do work every day, just like other, other communities. And that doesn't even speak to the other kinds of debts and challenges. And the other thing that it doesn't speak to, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of these folks that we're talking about, they got, uh, sometimes caregiver responsibilities or major health crises or things of that nature. They even exacerbate matters even more. And so we got to figure out how do we, we do this problem. So 
Most of the cities, and you all are doing some of this, let me just say this at the outset, most of the cities who want to tackle these issues are embarking upon this notion of how do we create more equitable and inclusive development that leads to shared prosperity. Okay? And so we've been engaged with a number of cities around the country, uh, and I know ULI does a lot of this stuff. You all are doing some stuff here. Uh, and with uh, National League of Cities and uh, uh, Bruce Katz's group at, at um, uh, uh, Brookings and the like, um, what is equitable development? Equitable development unlocks the full potential of the local economy by dismantling barriers and expanding opportunities for low-income people and communities of color. Through accountable public action and investment, it grows quality jobs and increases entrepreneurship, ownership, and wealth. The result is a stronger, more competitive city. So you tackle, in essence, the problem that I just painted for you when we do equitable and inclusive development. Inclusive development ensures that all marginalized and excluded groups are stakeholders in the development process. They're at the table. There's a return on investment for them. And inclusive growth not only creates new economic opportunities, but it also ensures equal access to the opportunities created for all segments of society, particularly the poor. It focuses on increasing per capita income through economic growth and greater access to non-income aspects of well-being enhanced by proactive policy making by, state, by the state and contributions from other actors. Those are just basic def definitions of when we talk about inclusive and equitable growth. So what do we know about inclusive and equitable growth? And we've, uh, because we're assisting communities with this now, I want to share with you what we know about the key drivers of inclusive and equitable development. We've been around the country looking at what lots of, things, lots of cities and communities are doing. So these are the big takeaways. And again, you can figure out the ones that you're already doing and some that you might need to pick up on. If you're going to do equal, equitable and inclusive development, what the research shows around the country is that the city has to lead as an engine of opportunity. Whatever your budget is, that means you are that amount of money as a business enterprise. Durham is a $55 million enterprise and you gotta treat it like an enterprise, and you gotta use those dollars to create and to level the playing field and create opportunities. So how do you do that as a city? You serve first and foremost as a model employer. You can't tell other people what to do if you don't do it yourself. Not you per se, but I'm talking about the global you. You gotta understand and dismantle the barriers to economic participation, and you gotta enact policies, procedures, and practices that promote equity, inclusion, and shared prosperity. And you gotta expand services to support workers and job seekers. You know, sometimes cities do stuff uh, that do more harm to folks than good. I'll give you an example. We got a group in Durham called the Neighborhood Improvement Services Group. All they do is go around and they look at neighborhoods and things they don't like, they cite people. So a little old lady, she could afford to cut the grass in her front yard, but she couldn't afford to cut the grass in the backyard. So they cite her and the citation is $400, okay? And if you can't pay it, what do they do? put a lien on your property. And what happens to your credit rating? There are enough knuckleheads running around and say, boy, go cut that latest grass. <laughs> you just created a job for somebody and you solved the problem. We got barriers like that all over the place that we can fix and we can expand and help people uh, do this kind of work. So there are some policies, procedures, and practices that go into this inclusive equitable development toolkit. Let me just run through them quickly for you. So when you start talking about economic inclusion and equitable development, first and foremost, as a city, you got to leverage the economic power of anchor institutions and infrastructure investments. 
You got to lev leverage all of those things. You got big employers here. You got to make sure that they're on, a, on, 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 a way, on the same wavelength with this equitable and inclusive development. And you're rebuilding the infrastructure of the community. That's huge opportunities in rebuild. And you got to fix some infrastructure because you got an aging population and your infrastructure is not age friendly. Those are all opportunities to do what? Create jobs, create business opportunities. All of those things exist. You got to be able to leverage them. Then you know what your high opportunity in industry sectors are. You got to be purposeful and intentional in leveraging those opportunities to level the playing field, create opportunities to eliminate that working poor population and, and the like. I already talked about repairing the existing infrastructure, huge opportunities. Every place, whether it's in the public sector, the private sector, retail sector, whatever, none of these places are age friendly. Huge opportunity right there to fix it, to fix it. <clears throat> and how about contracting with historically underutilized businesses? How many minority-owned and women-owned millionaires have you all cr created in this city? Hmm? Can you point to any? That's a metric. That's a metric. And the cities that do this really well, that's what they do. They do. That's what they do. And how do you support worker cooperatives and employee-owned businesses? Why is that important? It's because some of us in the business community are aging out, about to retire. What's your succession plan for those businesses? You want to keep them in your community. But you know what? Only about 20% of boomer businesses execute a, su a successful succession plan. You lose them. You have an opportunity to figure out, first of all, you need to know who they are. And secondly, you need to be engaging them because you want to keep those businesses in the community and figure out how do you do that succession so that they're still here and viable. Tax paying, tax contribution, job creating kinds of engines in your community. So maybe it's a group of workers who work there and they want to buy the company. Becomes an employee on company. I don't know, there are a number of different uh, opportunities and ideas, but you have to think about all of that. <clears throat> and when you do inclusive and equitable development, there's a, there are a number of strategies for engaging and getting that employment percentage up. And so a lot of communities that do development, they engage in community workforce agreements inclusive hiring policies or target area hiring policies. So you got a new building going up. You got a big prime contractor. What percentage of those jobs that's tied to that go to your local community? What, what's the rule? If you come to my town, 30% of the jobs that go, are gonna come to, gonna be for what? People locally, okay? Those are inclusive hiring policies, or maybe it's, for us, it's Northeast Central Durham or East Durham. We say, no, you're going to do business here? You're going to build something here? Well, you need to hire a certain percentage of your people from this community. It's a targeted area hiring policy. No, now, that doesn't mean you're just trying to hire somebody that didn't qualify. You got to connect the dots on the other hand. But you got to be purposeful and intentional when you're doing this. And this is what equitable uh, communities do. They have local hiring ordinances ta or targeted hiring ordinances or inclusive policies about various groups that are underrepresented. Some of them have community benefit agreements. Some of them say companies coming in, you need to put, a, do put dollars in a pool to, to train local workers so that they can be viable in the community and the like. Uh, specific project labor agreements that it's the, it's, the, it's the new coliseum or whatever. That project got a set of goals, set of strategies for job creation, community development, and the like. Uh, do y'all have a band the box ordinance? Hmm? Y'all know what it is? Okay, you got one? I did not know this until I got into this stuff that if you, at least in North Carolina, if you got a felony record, and you come out and you go to barber school, you can't qualify for a license. You can't qualify for a barber's license. You already paid your dues. You can't qualify for a barber's license. 
Or if your credit score is not. Certain things you can't do. Can't do. Those are all barriers. Keep people out. People can work every day. Y'all know what YMB is? Y'all know what NIMBY is, right? Not in my backyard. Increasing communities now uh, introducing YIMBY, probably yes in my backyard, moving away from exclusionary uh, single family zoning ordinances to say, let's be more diverse so we can talk about affordable housing, affordable mix and the like. And this um, uh, Minneapolis has started this movement and it's gonna, I think, gonna be a very, very important thing in terms of more diverse communities, more affordable housing, a whole range of other things there. <clears throat> and, Communities like Durham that are growing like crazy and pricing everybody out of the market, a lot of these communities are implementing community stabilization pro po policies, just cause eviction policies, rent stabilization, relocation protections and financial assistance for renters displaced by development, helping people out. Right now we got people, I got people at my school, they commute from Burlington, North Carolina. We're not making any money and gotta commute that far to work every day. I mean, it just doesn't work, doesn't work. Affordable housing preservation strategies. How do you maintain that affordable housing mix? How do you do that? Right of return policy, you displace somebody with a new development, they ought to have a right of return, right? Come back, you want an interest of diversity and proactive code enforcement uh, without doing Commercial stabilization project processes, they have policies for uh, public mitigation uh, funding for small businesses impacted by infrastructure improvement. Sometimes you improve the infrastructure, businesses get relocated, displaced and the like. Some cities have a fund to help those businesses out. You wanna keep them in your community and the like, so they have that. And they have technical assistance programs and access to low cost capital for businesses in commercial districts experiencing rapid change. I mean, we got five uh, businesses, minority owned businesses downtown because the rents are going skyrocketing out of, man, they gotta move, they getting pushed out. And so now we're talking about a pool of dollars that subsidize, if we can freeze the tax base and give a big company and zillions of dollars to come in, why can't you help and think about those smaller businesses in your community to maintain the diversity and the like? That's what equitable communities do in terms of all of this stuff. The other big thing in this space that equitable commu communities do, they create a more inclusive entrepreneurial business ecosystem. Because remember, your city is a major enterprise. You spend a lot of money with contractors and the like. How do you make sure in your contracting you're being inclusive and equitable in what you do? So in order to be, to have this inclusive ecosystem, you need to understand the deficiencies in your system that might suppress the potential success of historically underutilized businesses. And you rectify that situation by establishing what is called a contracting equity program, where you improve opportunity of access for historically underrepresented businesses. And what we know about these inclusive uh, entrepreneurial business ecosystems is that the cities that do that, they establish quantifiable goals for utilization of historically utilized businesses, and they hold all departments within city government accountable for demonstrating progress. Okay. If you have a goal, we want to do business with 25% women, 30% minority-owned businesses, all of that. That's a goal. Every department, I want to know how well are you doing. And that doesn't mean just big infrastructure projects because you buy everything from pencils to cars to those infrastructure projects. You got to make sure that you're being equitable in that spin. And you, uh, these cities typically transform their procurement systems into a fully automated supply chain system. I should be able to walk into your city and say, how are you doing with diversity spend? You should be able to walk over to the computer and pull it up for every department in your city and talk about where you are given your goal for the year. There's, there are systems now that will enable you to do that, but you gotta be intentional, you gotta be purposeful. And to grow those historically underrepresented businesses, you gotta offer education, training, and technical assistance programs that are robust enough to serve a pipeline of potential vendors, ranging from startups to boomer-owned businesses. There's a whole uh, uh, set of groups. 
And you got to create maker spaces in these underrepresented communities to provide ease access to education, training, and technical assistance, as well as networking opportunities. We got a lot of incubators and accelerators downtown in Durham, but if you're from a poor community and you can't afford parking downtown, that might as well be in South Africa. Nobody ever thought about that. Every time I go downtown, I can't eat lunch the next day. It's the parking fees. You just think about somebody on a fixed income, you need to go downtown to do, get trained. Training, these things need to be in the communities that need the help. Need the help. And you need to devise multi-channel communication <laughs> strategies to spread the word about contracting opportunities, available education training and technical assistance programs uh, available to help small business and disadvantaged businesses. And you need to be able to advertise and forecast uh, what you're doing in terms of what is called diversity spend. How well are you doing with women-owned businesses? How well are you doing on, with traditionally underrepresented businesses to grow those businesses to viable enterprises? Why is it important to grow minority and women-owned businesses? Because they are more likely to hire women and minorities than other businesses. So the, the externality effects, again, are positive in all of this. And that's what equitable communities are. What does a contracting equity program look like where they typically embrace multi-jurisdictional certification. So that means that if you get certified as a uh, minority or women-owned business in the state of Tennessee, you ought to rep recognize it at a local level here or in some other county. You do it in a seamless kind of way so you don't have to go through that because that's an expensive thing. Uh, they create clarity and collaboration on goal setting. How, what, what's the rate? What's the percentage of, people, of business are you going to do this year with these folks? And then you commit to subcontractors at bid time. See, right now, most uh, supply diversity programs, they put the onus on the prime contractor to select and choose the what? Subcontractor. But what does, what does the contractor need to do to demonstrate that he's done? He has to do what is called good faith effort looking for a subcontractor. You know what constitutes a good faith effort? Sending out an email. <laughs> Sending out an email blast. It says, we're bidding. That's a good faith effort. Has no teeth in it. Has no teeth in it. <clears throat> and institute, and, you, and cities monitor contracts to the end, and they institute prompt payment of subcontractors. I was just working with a project in, in uh, North Carolina. It was a highway construction project, a minority firm, it was a, a year and a half project. The minority firm's business was in the first three months of the project, <coughs> but they didn't get paid to the end of the project. To the end. What happens to you along the way? You got all you, you invested all your capital there. You can't pay your bills. Your credit goes jacked up and you can fix these things. You can fix these things. That's what it takes to do this. And and you redefine master contract because you oftentimes hear that, well, minority contractors can't handle or women-owned business can't handle this contract. Well, then split it up into size of pieces that they can handle parts of it because that's what uh, sustainable communities do. And, and I think you as a city, you got to be active in connecting the dots with subcontractors and prime contractors. Don't just put the onus on the prime to find people. You got to be an orchestra conductor and making it happen. That's what these cities do oftentimes when they do this. And so I don't know if you know what an equitable sourcing model looks like, but this is the one for, that, uh, for one of the cities that we've been working on. Uh, the city itself purchases from three sources. They purchase some goods and services from a statewide purchasing pool. They have some local vendors and then they have some cooperative contracting purchasing things. And the question becomes, how diverse are these various players here? Has anybody ever looked inside those statewide purchasing pools and said, how many of the businesses in there are diverse suppliers? And what does our diversity spend with those suppliers? Yeah, there's an economy of scale. You save money 
by being in a statewide purchasing pool, but how many of those people are women-owned businesses that you're buying from or underrepresented minority-owned businesses in that pool? That's how you grow your local community. Now, same thing for local vendors. And over here, I know a concrete example. In this community that I built this model on, they buy all of their police cars. All their police cars is, are Dodge cars, and they buy them from a local vendor. Now, Question number one, how inclusive is Dodge, right? Number two, when you buy a police car, you gotta, somebody's gotta put the electronics and all of that stuff in it, right? So I can get y'all when you're speeding, right? Somebody's gotta put the decals, paint, and all of that, right? How inclusive is that work? How inclusive is it? Anybody ever thought to look? Anybody thought to look? I mean, those are the kinds of things. And so, and all of these things you want to know and say, if we're going to do business with you, you have to have issues of equity and inclusion and expenditure of your money. So you want these diverse suppliers, many of them local, because they do what? They create jobs, they create a tax base for you and all of that. So it becomes a form of enlightened self-interest for you to institute this kind of uh, policy and procedure to make things happen. <clears throat> And what we know is that firms that embrace supply diversity are more competitive with financial returns above national averages. It's good for business. They create jobs and generate revenue that redound to the benefit of the local community. Unemployed and underemployed residents benefit from some these systems. Why? Because when you create those opportunities for those local businesses, they hire workers in the community that pay taxes and all of that, spend money in the economy. It's, it has a... Uh, Effect And cities that adopt these diverse supply chain management systems are more attractive places to live and do business. You see rankings now of cities that do this really, really well. And we know it works because there are a bunch of uh, very, very successful models out there of using these diverse supply chain management systems. <clears throat> Cities that do economic equitable development also establish what is called an equitable development venture fund. They put together a pool of dollars that are explicitly the primary investment vehicle to support the growth and expansion of homegrown historically underutilized bits. So you hear a lot of folks talk about access to capital as a problem. This is what lots of these cities are doing now. They put their own equitable development fund and they support ventures that align with the triple bottom line of sustainability and that are designed to retain, retain population and economic diversity. They, uh, uh, it creates the opportunity to address both the jobless poor and the working poor problem, and they leverage support from national and regional philanthropy and financial institutions who have embraced impact investing. This is a huge thing, these impacting investing funds now around the country. Here are a whole series of them. In fact, revesting refers to investments made into companies, organizations, and funds with the intention to generate a measurable, beneficial social and environmental impact alongside financial return. These are the ones around the country that have been implemented in various cities, and they're having an incredible kind of impact on creating equity and inclusive uh, uh, economic development in these places. Um, we're really getting ready to launch one in Durham called a Bull City Exec Equitable Fund. Finally, the communities that do this work really, really well, they build collective ambition. What is collective ambition? It's a summary of how leaders and employees think about why they exist, what they hope to accomplish, how they will collaborate to achieve their ambition, and how their brand promise aligns with their core values. The goal of collective ambition is to mobilize and garner support from diverse stakeholders and constituencies to achieve equitable and inclusive development. This concept of collective ambition actually was developed by two of my colleagues at the business school at Keaton Flagler. They studied companies who made a ton of money during the Great Recession when everybody else was losing their shirt in the marketplace. And so they said, how did you do that? And they said, they, they found out through the surveys and the work that they leveraged the power of collective ambition. It's a Harvard business uh, paper. And collective ambition has two pieces. Collaborative engagement is the glue. How do you make sure people work together? with a common focus and vision. 
And how do you do disciplined execution of strategy? If a layup will do, I don't need you trying to shoot a three-pointer, <laughs> okay? Strategy is your roadmap. But what I found in working with lots of cities is departments don't even talk to each other. They won't even share information with each other. How are you going to have discipline execution of strategy when everybody out there trying to be, the, be, you know, whatever your favorite player is tonight, better be from Chapel Hill, but anyway. <laughs> And to, to monitor and demonstrate how well you are doing, cities that do this really well have what is called a sustainability scorecard. Where's the, dev, where's the data? Where's the evidence that you're doing what you say you're supposed to be doing? And what is a sustainability scorecard? It's a set of performance metrics to ensure that community economic development policies, procedures, and practices pass the triple bottom line of sustainability litmus test. What is that litmus test? It's about social equity, it's about environmental stewardship, and it's about sh shareholder, stakeholder value. It's about profit, it's about the planet, it's about people if you look at it globally. It's at the intersection of this Venn diagram uh, if you are achieving the kinds of goals and outcomes of becoming a sustainable community, you are sustainable on all three dimensions. It's not a one-legged stool, it's not a two-legged stool, it's a three-legged stool, and that's what, uh, and there are all kinds of metrics, there are there, um, lots of uh, organizations now are ranking cities on, in terms of their sustainability, uh, and to get on one of those rankings is an important thing because people are looking at those rankings uh, in terms of places. Up quickly, and I'm gonna wrap up, we've, uh, been doing inclusive eco development in Durham. I'm just going to show you the roadmap. It's a very, we've taken all of those things that we've talked about here and we built a plan for Durham called Built to Last, equal uh, uh, inclusive development plan for Durham. Uh, put that inclusive development policy toolkit, developed a sustainability scorecard for them a strategy and a training program for stakeholder collective ambition, and we put together this inclusive business and workforce development system that has the supply chain management, has maker spaces in poor communities or underrepresented communities, and it has training for SBE uh, and uh, DBE programs, and we have that Bull City Equity Development Fund. We're working on affordable housing for working poor teachers and civil servants. We're doing age-friendly community development and Latino new urbanism to accommodate the populations that we have. And we have a whole cadre of vulnerable older adults that need our assistance and we're leveraging dollars, going to leverage dollars out of this equity development fund to deal with all of those issues. Uh, and that's the logic model that undergirds it. It's got the inputs, the activities, the outputs, and what we're hoping to uh, achieve with this thing. This has been a about a nine-month undertaking to do things. That's the inclusive supply diversity program that we've developed uh, here. And we have something for everybody from the aspiring entrepreneur with a startup vision to the certified people who are certified as DBEs and small businesses. And you have a lot of dis disenchanted small businesses. They've gone through the certification process, want to do business with the city, but never got any business. Next time they come up, they say, I ain't doing this again. Well, you don't want to lose those businesses. You want to bring them back in to the fold. And then there are these encore entrepreneurs. Anybody heard about encore entrepreneurs? People who have retired, they think they're going to play golf every day. They get bored as bat doo-doo in about two weeks. They're hanging out a shingle. You want all of those people. You want to be able to keep them in there. And then you want all those boom, boomer business owners who are about to retire. You want to figure out how to keep those businesses in your community. So your training program has to be a life course training program from here to here and in terms of inclusiveness. And you want to leverage procurement opportunities for these folks to grow those businesses. And your performance matrix is go back into making sure that you achieve your goal. <clears throat> That's the way it works. And so, if you're going to do this, there's some prerequisites. One thing you got to do is unlearn old ways of thinking and doing. Some of you are still doing things you did in 1938. 
and you're going to get mad with people who tell you that you can't do it that way anymore. So you got to become a learning organization. You got to have an entrepreneurial mindset, looking for opportunities, calculating risk and rewards, because the new normal is certain uncertainty. What you did yesterday may be totally obsolete tomorrow, and you got to be poised to do what? Pivot. That's what my kids in that class say, pivot. If they say it again, I'll we'll knock them out. But it's just <laughs> pivot. It, I mean, but that's the nature of the landscape. You got to pivot when things ain't going right. And you got to have an unwavering commitment to innovation, beta test, pri prototype, and scale in this economy and society. And multi-sector collaboration is, uh, prop, uh, is very, very important across the public-private sector. This, and that thing, discipline, execution of strategy. People fail on this one all the time. You gotta have the discipline to execute on the model that we put together if you're going to achieve the kinds of outcomes. <clears throat> if you do it, I think you'll have a more inclusive and equitable and sustainable city. You're gonna have core values and performance metrics that demonstrate a commitment to inclusive and equitable development. Because I tell you, increasingly, people who wanna move and come to Memphis or any other city, they're gonna be looking for these metrics. I do lots of work for corporations, and I can tell you, today, these are the things. And the big money for those funds, from J.P. Morgan Chase, Bloomberg, and all of those folks, this is it, folks, if you get that money. That's what they want. You need that effective supply chain management system that supports the growth and development of traditionally underrepresented businesses and a major investment pool that promotes shared prosperity by investing in ventures that uh, improve the living arrangements and overall quality of life for the working poor because when you do that, you're going to benefit the non-working poor because working poor people spend their money in the economy and it reverberates to creating additional jobs, additional businesses and things of that nature. So it's a win-win kind of strategy. Um, I've been in this business for close to 40 years now, and what I will say to you uh, is I've never felt better about a project that we have done than this one that we just did in Durham because uh, I feel it personally with the staff that work at our school, with the kids that we serve every day. And I know it's important to do this because uh, this past year, one of our kids from one of the poorest neighborhoods in Durham, we are K-8 school, he finished, and he got a $57,000 scholarship to one of the most prestigious boarding schools in America that no one would have ever predicted that this kid would do that. That's $57,000 a year, wow. not just over 40, that's per year. And, uh, but, and he got his start right there in that school with those teachers that now don't have what? Housing. Housing. So we're not talking about the dregs of society, we're talking about the best among us that need a helping hand, and so we have to leverage the power and influence of our communities to ensure that those people, not those people, that our people, what? have equal opportunity of access. Because if I can look at those numbers and find them, what do you think other people can do? They can do the same thing, probably better than me. And so uh, I, I think that this is very, very important work. I know you're doing some of it here, um, but I think the whole notion of a coherent strategy and a re report card every year, say, how well are we doing? And if you're not doing well, fix it, fix it because at the end of the day, it's all about our people. I'll stop there.